Welcome to the Creative Plane Podcast Network. Join us as we review our favorite RPGs, collectible card games, MMOs, video games, PC games, and bring up interesting topics and things that we'd like to share with everyone. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the 5th Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Hey guys, Jim here with Creative Plan Podcast Network. Today I'm going to be bringing you three genius minds that are writers and role players and RPG aficionados that I like, that I follow, that I actually own every one of their RPG supplements that they have out in PDF or paper form. By the way, go paper form, it's way better. So... I'm going to introduce the three of you guys, and then let's get you each some time to uh, let everybody know who you are. First, I've got Justin Oldham, the mind and drive behind the RPG and novels of the After Collapse RPG series. We've got Evan Cook, the founder and mad scientist behind the creations of Paradigm Lost, LLC. Hopefully that Kickstarter dice comes in, and I get to play with them in our next game when we get back to playing games in person because you yeah, know the whole good. social distancing thing is murder on the rpgs yeah oh yeah oh yeah. and last but not least john paul reed the writer and game master behind the arizona fantasy <laughs> gaming association and the genius behind the medford family chronicles book series which you can get on amazon and book five is now out right yes yes sir cool. so i'll let you guys each introduce yourselves and a little about it yourself so justin go ahead and go first Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Justin Oldham, and I bring you greetings from the top of the world. I plead guilty as charged. I am the creator of AC After Collapse, which, if you're interested in following along with the discussion, you can find at acaftercollapse.com. While we're talking about this, and for those of you who don't know what that means, if it just doesn't ring a bell immediately, it's a post-apocalyptic tabletop role-playing game. Now, you try saying that after three shots, and you're a champ. (laughs) (laughs) So... To get right down to it, yes, I built the role-playing game, and I have written all the novels and all of the anthologies that have followed since I first got the bug for all of this in the winter of 1983. That's that's dating me a little bit, but uh, for for millennials out there, that's 20th century. But uh, (laughs) there I was. I was a smart-ass senior in high school. I was getting ready to graduate, go out, set the world on fire. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine was sitting at the cafeteria table one day with uh, a copy of first edition Gamma World, a copy of second edition Gamma World, and he says, I totally know we can do this. And by, by, by we, I mean you. And so I just, you know, I was having a good day, and so I just looked at him and said, okay, fine, I will. And 36 years later, the crime is a reality. <laughs> yeah. Very and, cool. And apocalyptic RPGs and fiction are fun. I mean, as as a you know, as a Gen Xer, I do like me some apocalypse. Absolutely, because it will challenge you in ways. Now, I'm, I, I don't, I don't knock my brothers and sisters across the aisle over there in the the, the fantasy RPG department, but there are. After you've done the classic fantasy dungeon crawl and gotten the thief killed a few times and you know <laughs> ha- had the wizard incinerated, and then you go and you do the post-apocalyptic version of the dungeon crawl, and the first few times, it'll drive you out of your mind. After that, it's like good whiskey. You, you, you want more. You don't know where you find it, but you want it. <laughs> <laughs> You keep trying till you find a woody tannin flavored one that you really like. 
Hmm. So, and that's uh, a good that, that that is a good metaphor for the, the post apocalyptic experience because it's not all negative. You sit down at your game table, you got your favorite dice after a long week, 40, 50 hour grind. You would like to get rich or die trying, or you'd like to go out there and rebuild the shattered world, whichever appeals to the inner gamer. And when you can do it or die epically, it uh, is very satisfying. I have to agree with that. Yeah, I like that a lot. There's a reason why the Wastelander, you know, uh, cosplay circuit is pretty good. And, you know, Mad Max has taught us a lot of good things. You know, I'm just saying. (laughs) I want to cap all of this uh, by, by, by mentioning one last point. I did not want to write just another post-apocalyptic role-playing game. I've been doing role-playing games for almost four decades, and the one thing I know beyond all other things is that gamers mod. No matter what you publish, they're going to tear it apart, rebuild it, and use it their way. So what I did was I built for you a modular post-apocalyptic role-playing game kit. There's enough math out there to make the nerds happy. There's enough segmented step-by-step basic advanced material for the world builders out there. If you want to play in the genre, but you have no experience with it, but you'd like a tour guide to say, no, 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 this is real radiation. Then, you know, that th- this is what I have created for you. And if I sound like I'm having fun with it, yes, I am, because for the better part of 25 years, I beat my head against the wall. I tore my hair out. I'm, at, I'm, I'm three inches shorter than I used to be. And I, as proud as I am of this, I hope never to repeat this experience again. <laughs> <laughs> and I will agree with you. You did create After Collapse, which is an amazing toolbox for whatever genre of apocalypse you want. You can do it. So I have to ask you, John, um, are you saying that you lost the paradigm when making this? <laughs> <laughs> Justin, Pro- yeah. prof- professional courtesy requires me to say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. next, let me go ahead and introduce Evan. Speaking of paradigms. <laughs> hey there. Well, so, um, yeah, I, I kind of created Paradigm Loss. Uh, originally, it was actually a different business, but, you know, I had to lose the paradigm and I did something new. I wanted to, right now, board games and card games and tabletop RPGs, they're like, they're huge, especially with my generation, millennials. Uh, And we're starting to sort of, you know, uh, I don't know how to to say it, but basically kind of uh, pass down that torch from the Gen Xers who passed it down to us, the millennials, and now we're kind of passing it down to a new generation. They have their own interests and their own preferences, but um, what I find is, is there's sort of uh, two sorts of gamers that are emerging. And we have these gamers that really like the, the old school pen and paper, Dungeons and Dragons, TSR, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> old, old, old school games. Uh, and then we have, um, well, what my what my generation might say is a, a casual gamer. Um, when I went to college, we called these uh, beer and pretzel gamers, where mm-hmm. their their interest is to kind of break into the genre and sort of just have fun. Um, where you know, we, people with experience, we we kind of. Um, we, we really like to know how we want to have fun in the game. And this will kind of, I'll kind of talk about this later with the GMing stuff, but um, when I created a game, I wanted to create something new. And so I created uh, a card game that was a tabletop role-playing game. Um, and your, your character sheet fits on a card, and the rest of it's a deck. Uh, I have different rules to sort of make thing you know to switch things up it's not just a a random deck that you're pulling out of there's a lot of abilities that you can do to stack your deck 
Uh, and in fact, it's an entire game about stacking your deck. Um, but the thing was, I needed for this game. I started beta alpha testing it really, and <laughs> I needed a lot of stuff for it. I needed ways of tracking HP on all the characters. Uh, I needed dice. So well, I didn't need dice. I had a whole drawer full. But I started thinking about making accessories, and so that's where this mad science stuff comes from. I uh, I went into a game store. I had no money, nothing. I had nothing. And I said, hey, I have this idea for a game accessory. It's a game tracker. If you buy, you know, so many of these things at this price, I can I can make them for you. He agreed. I did it. I uh, He just... He handed me some money. I gave that to a local laser cutter uh, with my designs. They cut it out. Uh, it didn't work out so well. I ended up owing money, but the money I did grab from that, I got my own laser cutter. Started out with a, just a real small, you know, Chinese K40 thing. It did not work very well. I called it the Death Star for a reason. <laughs> uh, the uh, basically the laser would charge the water particles that cooled down the laser tube and it would cause crazy 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 static shocks um and you'd electrocute yourself really bad it, it would tear apart the cooling bags i would throw in the cooling container um but anyway uh but you know from that point i slowly built up um i took you know i, I reinvested 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 and uh took my retirement and my wife's retirement and we, you know, got a new laser and <laughs> we uh, started developing um, uh, new ways of manufacturing things and reproducing things and started coming up with all of these crazy products for D&D and dice recipes and all. It just exploded from there. And I met a lot of people th online through Facebook <laughs> and it exploded from there. So, you know, currently I'm working on the lore for my R uh, RPG, and I have a, a a staff of writers that are all helping me now. I have editors, lore checkers, all kinds. It's just it's impossible to keep track of because I have this multiverse game instead of like a post-apocalyptic thing. Uh, we're working on um, combining mini worlds theory with the multiverse theory. So uh, I won't go into the specifics of that and why they're actually different. That's I'll leave that up to you guys. I'm sure you might be interested. <laughs> I used to be a science teacher, and uh, I really wanted to have a really strong science base for my lore, and that's where I started. And you know I'm having it uh, checked out by Dr. Erin McDonald. I met her at a convention, and she did the science lore checking for Picard season two that hasn't come out yet. Mm, so, nice. yeah, I'm really excited. I have a bunch of artists um, hired on. So Quinn McSherry is my uh, art director and he was able to get in touch with a lot of um, famous artists in, uh, in the industry. You may know of Bruce Bernice. Um, he did uh, Numenera. Uh, the, the art for Numenera. Um, he's also did a lot of fantasy flight stuff, cryptozoic, all kinds of things. And he'll be doing our maps. Uh, he's doing four maps for us. Uh, that'll be released with the initial modules and some pre-generated card decks that you can use to build your own characters and stuff like that. But yeah, it's been a crazy adventure. It's only getting crazier. And, you know, people like James have really helped me connect with... Um, uh, veterans in the field, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I'm i extremely grateful to both uh, the, the Tucson gaming community, but also to uh, the gaming community as a whole, because everybody has been very supportive and people just love to work together. And that's, and that's part of, you know, my, I'll close this out and cap it off by saying that, you know, my, um, my business motto is to play with your heart achieve with your mind and don't forget to be excellent to each other. Which is, which is a fantastic motto, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. And let's go on over to John Paul. You patiently waited. <laughs> yes, sir. Let me start off by saying, I believe that uh, Justin and I are contemporaries. Um, 
I started playing Dungeons and Dragons way back in 1977. I graduated high school in 1984. Well, it's interesting. What I'm about to say here will be heresy for you guys. Please forgive me. But I've never created my own uh, RPG. I've always used just Dungeons and Dragons and the various editions for whatever rules I would need. Now, consider setting that aside a second. In 1978, I started dungeon mastering. I literally, I started with a big, huge imperial city that my players would adventure in. Then my players said, wow, we want to fight pirates. So I put the Forsaken Islands four days sail north of Paladon City, but otherwise they were out in the boonies and generally ignored where there would be pirate lairs. So as, as my players started playing the game, my, my world, my fantasy role-playing game world just expanded from there. Uh, and uh, now I have three continents. I have uh, hundreds of uh, settings from everything from jungles to deserts to multiverse, uh, multiplanar adventures. I've, and what's really funny is I've been playing D&D for so long that in 2012, I was running a... a just uh, I think it was still uh, I think it was still using 3.5 then, various editions. I was uh, in 2012. I was uh, running a game in Illinois, and uh, a friend of mine, Arthur, he's like John. My wife wants to come and play D and D. Now at first I was nervous about this, not 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 for any personal reasons or anything. Usually when spouses come to a game, if if they don't like it, if they're bored. They start working on their spouse. Oh, oh, spend more time at home. Stop playing that game all the time, right? So, um, but the opposite happened. When Arthur brought Laura to my game in 2012, Laura, who had never played a D&D game or anything like that before, she dove right into it like they ducked to water. She loved it. She started going through my file cabinets with all of my materials and my stories and my maps. And she's like, John, this stuff is wonderful. She found a short story that I wrote up years ago, and she read it, and she's like, John, this is terrific. Where's the rest of it? And I'm like, well, uh, Laura, um, there, there is no more. I, you know, I just stopped writing. Well, you know the old saying, behind every great man, there's a great woman nagging. I mean, uh, <laughs> urging him on. And so... Uh, well, uh, Laura started helping me edit my started writing books. And that's another story. She said, with all this wonderful material, John, why don't you write books? And I was at first, I was like, <laughs> what a silly idea. What a stupid idea. Why should I write books? And then I stopped and I was like, you know, that's really not a bad idea, you know. <laughs> so now now I'm, I'm working on my sixth book. It's hard to describe, but I'm just moved. Uh, two months ago, and my publisher is one of my roommates, Patty Holstrom. So I'm constantly nagging her to help me get my next book out. <laughs> and, uh, well, but uh, but anyway, I don't want to talk too much. I want to share the the time with everybody. But may I? Do I have time for one more story, James, before we change topic? I, I think you can sneak one more in there. Okay, it is so funny when when, when I first went to Patty Holstrand when I first met her uh, in 2014. Uh, she, uh, she met me in a Denny's. She had read my first manuscript and she said, John, this is terrific. We're going to cut your book in half. I freaked. No, half of my book is crap. Nobody will read it. Uh, if you only read, like, if you tear up, if you, if you edit out half of the book, no one will understand what's going on. Oh, this is terrible. What are we going to do? And, and Patty come after Patty finally calmed me down. She's like, no, 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 John. Book one and book two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so since then, since then I'm like I say I have five books out. You can find them. Well, you can find my four books, my first four books out on Amazon. Uh, my fifth book you can contact me directly for, and it'll soon be out on Amazon and Kindle once once the coronavirus dust settles. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, believe it or not, I've got my sixth book 
completed in basic draft. And hopefully July, August, September, Patty Holster and I will be slogging through my sixth book to get it ready for the holiday season. Very um, nice. <laughs> uh, okay, I've, uh, I'm, I'm very eager to talk about world building and how I always avoid writer's block. <laughs> I, I'm blessed. I I just have so much material. I like okay, which 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 old, which former player character will I use, and what adventure did they go on, and oh yeah, let's. <laughs> this is this is what I do. I oh, and one one last sentence, and then I'll shut up. Uh, you know all those dusty old library books that hardly anybody reads. Oh man, I find great stuff there. I I. I I got this one book at like three or four pages on each Roman emperor from Augustus all the way to Romulus Augustus. Whenever I'm stuck, I'm like, okay, which, which perverse, crazy, lunatic emperor should I talk about now? And what, <laughs> what story can I model from this? Here we go. So, yeah, I, okay. I, now, James, Evan, Justin, you have to shut me up. You have to <laughs> shut up, John. Okay. Oh, I like it. You. <laughs> so so we'll go ahead and so the topic of the day is going to be tips and tricks to writing stories for your RPG game. So pretty much all three of you, you know, are great at writing stories because, you know, I've read all of you, all three of you yours work. So RPGs and stories, I consider all three of you experts on those topics. So we'll go ahead and start with Justin. So first off, give 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 one to three tips in general when it comes to story writing. What, what are some tips you would definitely throw out there as, for me, these three things work for me? Go ahead and start, Justin. Okay, first and foremost, understand the commercial potential of what it is you are doing. Way back in the day, when I first conceived of the concept of building my own game, Pretty much in the same thought, I had the idea of writing novels based on the game. Lar large companies, who shall remain nameless, have <laughs> since done this to great success. And back in the day, late 80s, early 90s, a lot of them were not much more than you know, a handful, you know, three, five, six people. They were the whole company, and yet... They still did it all. They subcontracted the novels and, and, and they, they, they went on to do, they went on to do great things. Well, okay. That, there, there's your guidepost. That is the commercial potential for what you can be doing eventually because the two things feed each other. People say, eh, the game was okay, but totally love the novels. I will commit my future life savings to the novels. Other people say, well, okay, yeah, the novels are, yeah, they give me a taste of the world, but I want to get my hands dirty. I want to make gamers miserable. I will buy the game. And that's so that there's a symbiotic relationship between the two. When you know that, you can start playing with this form of fire with or without oven mitts as you please. Once you know that, rule two, build the game First, I cannot say this enough. I have been I have been at five different podiums over the course of the last six years, and everybody looks at me like I'm not stupid. I can I can I can multitask. I can do I can do things at the same time. I, I'm half your age, dude. I'll run circles around. No, build the game first. Know the math, know the terminology, know the whole thing inside and out before you start allocating resources to the novels for, and I say this because there's one underlying reason there. When you have actually built the game, you have the freedom of control as the lord and monster of all you survey. You can decide how much of your game terminology goes into the novels, how much of your game terminology is never mentioned. You will screw yourself with a jackhammer if you start writing the novels before you have finished the game because you'll never remember what you were consistent about and what you weren't. So that's that's rule two. That's rule two. Rule three is think five and ten years down the road. AC after collapse as a game. The first, the, the, the basic rule book and six source books, 
was finished. It was in the can for four years before it ever went to print. And it's because I needed time to write those anthologies and those novels that you like so much. And the reason that that's important, you hang a little asterisk on that, is because today's digital world moves very fast. And the only way you will ever prevent your competitors from stealing a march on you, not that they would because they're all consummate professionals, but in the event that somebody wanted to one-off you, if you stay in the shadows, you bide your time and you wait. When you step out into the bright light of day and you have a fully formed product, the best design team in the country will look at you and they will cry because they know they can't catch you. That That's a really good one. That is – that th- th- those are the top three rules in that order right there. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, that's actually, those are a really good set of rules. Um, I'd say that definitely uh, I would follow each one of those. Uh, you will, I have to agree with Justin, you will fail if you do not follow those three basic rules. Um, you need to be prepared. You definitely have to understand your math inside and out um i have a very simple um mechanical system it's not very uh crunchy but if you if i didn't understand the ins and outs and how something simple can become very complex very quickly i wouldn't be able to write stories around it um so when it comes to writing stories what i would add to that um rather than saying i uh, a preference I would add as as sort of rules that I use is to consider when you're writing the the game. Motivation would be my first rule. As a teacher, being in charge of a bunch of really rowdy eighth graders that really don't want to be there, Mm -hmm. you find yourself doing dog and pony shows every single day, and it's still not good enough. So it's really important to establish with whatever you're doing, uh, whether it's fantasy, sci-fi, multiverse, mini worlds, whatever, you need to establish a good motivation for your players. Um, And not just the characters that they're gonna play. You want your players to come to that game as if it's a reward. So in psychology, we talk about intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. Extrinsic motivations are carrot and stick. Uh, you know, uh, come to the game and you'll have fun. You know, uh, come come to the game and I'll give you a soda. These are extrinsic motivations. They come from the outside. And so then we have these internal, intrinsic motivations. You want to go to game because it's fun. You want to go to this game because... You can do something in it that you can't do in Dungeons and Dragons. You want, and so when you're developing your game and your stories, you need to strongly consider who your audience is and who's going to be buying your product. Because, uh, so John's customers who've been playing D and D since 1977, probably not going to buy my product. Um, I I mean, they might. I'm not saying they wouldn't. Please do. <laughs> Please but, try it. But, but when, when in sales, before I was a teacher, I did sales. And you have to learn who and who isn't your customer. Yes. And so if you're selling to people who aren't ever going to buy your stuff, you're never going to sell anything. So you need to consider who your audience is and motivate that audience to get to – Give them what they want, what they're looking for that they can't really find in other areas or at least exaggerate what they're looking for in your product because that's what they really want. Um, And so that would be sort of my first rule is to understand motivations. Uh, And that goes with writing the game, too. But the other thing is, is if when you're making a game, you really need to consider um, your settings. So I've made a bunch of games. Um, a lot of them haven't really gone to sale. Um, 
but you know, as a teacher, I've made games, but also just for my own group. And I had to really consider the setting very, um, very strongly because when it comes to settings, what's in your world defines what your characters do in that world, what your players can do in that world. If you have a Western setting, well, likely laser beams and Gauss cannon or Gauss cannons, sorry, Gauss cannons probably not going to be involved in your story. Um, so that adds limitations. Uh, when I did martial arts, we talked about how everyone, when they're born, is like a canvas. And the more you mark on them, the more limited that canvas can be. And so you really want to consider your setting and how it limits you and how it can help you make a story. And that would be my third rule. Make glitches features. Find ways that problems in your story can end up being a great way to make it more fun. Play with your heart and achieve with your mind. Um, when I play as a player, um, I like to say that the difference between intelligence and wisdom, intelligence being, hey, I just, you know, that fort over there, I poisoned everybody in it and everybody died and we all just won. In 40, we all just won against this fort and beat, beat it in 45 minutes. Wisdom is realizing that role-playing isn't about winning. Role-playing is about having fun. And when you do that, when you end game in 45 minutes, you got to realize all the fun you missed. So you got to take the, glitch, the glitches and you have to turn them into features. Yeah, you might want to beat that game in 45 minutes, but think of all the adventure you might have when um, James might understand this when I say when you got to lie to that that guard about being a bounty hunter <laughs> <laughs> and it just does or does not work either way yeah. it becomes interesting and fun yeah and that's what you're there for is fun whether you're winning or losing you're there to have fun yeah it's uh. it's it's sort of like the the fail forward theory that a lot of RPGers when they learn fail forward is okay it's okay for the dice to be bad but as long as you're moving the story forward you know mm -hmm. absolutely that, that's definitely a good one because you know we all know at the game table dice will do things that in storybooks never happen right <laughs> or other times the dice do exactly what a storybook would have happen yeah. and it's great yeah it feels good so, so, John, what tips do you got? Well, um, gentlemen, your your tips and rules are marvelous. They're very well stated. Um, I'm sorry I disagree with some of them. You see, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't need to create my own game. <laughs> I've got I've got I've got Dungeons and Dragons. I've got all sorts of other games, whether it's uh, old stuff like Boot Hill and Top Secret or newer stuff like uh, Pathfinder. You know, I, the, the, why invent, why reinvent the wheel? Now, maybe I'm, maybe I shouldn't quote Gary Gygax. Don't never tell the game masters they don't need any rules. But <laughs> anyway, all right, okay, my three rules for writing my books, which are set in my fantasy world. Now, I believe in, I believe very strongly in homebrew rule uh, worlds um adventure league is a lot of fun but it's way too predictable and uh you know it's you're locked into uh doing certain things in certain steps and uh, I, I like giving my players free reign now to my three rules number one you've got to love what you're writing about when you're a publisher patty when you're a publisher calls you at three in the morning, John, we've got a big problem in chapter six. A whole page is missing and they're going to press at 6 a.m. Can you get up and change, you know, fix, fix the print, send it to me so I can send it to the printer. You know what? It, you've got to love what you're writing about. To get up at three in the morning and say, yeah, Patty, I'll get that done. And I got it done in an hour and a half and still had an hour and a half to spare. So, uh, so number one, you got to love what you're writing about. Because, okay, 
Number number two, um, you know, I like to write books that I want to read. Now, I they're, they're wonderful. There's so many marvelous books out there. I could I could I could spend hours just citing eight or nine. I could cite cite a hundred different book series that I like and are wonderful. But I'm I okay. And by the way, um, by the way, Evan, I. I taught uh, special ed for eight years in public schools. I also taught at a community college on again, off again as an adjunct for 20 years. And oh boy, I know what you mean about students. <laughs> at, at least, at least, the, at least the college students, they're paying to be there. So they're, right. they're, they're, they're a little more in tune with like, okay, I really should listen to this now. All right. Num rule two. Well, I've already said rule one. You got to love what you write. Rule two very important. You've got to remember that when write books that you want to read, share something with your reader. Hey, this is important to me. I'm sick of young adult books where the big climax at the end of the third book is when the 12 year old boy kisses the 13 year old girl. <gasps> oh, Oh please! You know, I, a little I, bit okay. of formula there, you know. Right. Yeah. I, I, I try. I try to write books that I would like to read. Now, my books are meant for ages twelve and up. Actually, my fifth book is definitely meant for ages fifteen and up. But, uh, but uh, anyway. The, but the so rule number two: write books that you yourself would enjoy reading. Number three, and. I'm echoing what Evan said before. I, I, I use the fancy word demographics. Write to your demographics. And now it's, a, it's sad, but it's true. 90%, uh, uh, maybe not that high, I'll say 80% of all fantasy readers are generally uh, men from ages, uh, ages 15 to 50. <laughs> I mean, you know, that that's the best demographic information I can find. And I see it all the time when I go to conventions. I see thousands of guys and maybe like it's it's growing now. But I, I remember conventions where I would see like maybe a 100 ladies and like that would be it. Now I'd say there are hundreds of ladies. It's definitely growing. I love cosplay. But again, you got to write for your demographics. So what I do People read my books and they contact me and, John, are you still dungeon mastering? Yeah. Now, whatever system you use, your own system, uh, uh, an old system, a reinvented system, a changed system, whatever, you can do whatever you want with it. In my world, with the multiverse, I have the Game Masters University. The Game Masters University is dedicated to exploring the entire multiverse, looking for new games to play. Uh, whether it, whether it's chess or let's play interdimensional thermonuclear war, you know all of these games. <laughs> and uh, you know, I uh, again, I, I I actually I actually bring in nukes, tanks, and other modern weapons in my fourth book. Uh, if you're if you're going to assault the nine hells, inter, uh, the nine hells planes, uh, uh, you're, you've got to you've got to have more than just magic. <laughs> yeah, you've got to bring some yeah. tricks. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I can pull in. Oh, hey, uh, I got I in, in several books. I've got a purple dragon. Yes, a purple dragon. One of the missing colors of the D&D dragons. Uh, dragon magazine, I think, was 69, an older dragon magazine. Purple dragon. This dragon actually shoots laser beams, just like Godzilla. So, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I, I can bring in lasers. I can bring in nukes. I can bring in whatever I want into my world. But I use the fantasy swords and sorcery to rather bind it all together. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so those are my three rules. Uh, uh, again, love what you love, what you write. Uh, number two, uh, write, uh, share something with your reader or put it another way. Uh, 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 love what you write. And of course, find uh, find your motivation through what you're doing. And three, again, you don't you don't need any rules. And well, write to your demographics. And uh, again, now people ask me all the time, 
don't you ever get writer's block? And I'm like, no. I mean, I, I can always pull in another demiplane or a, or an interdimensional plane or the seven heavens or the nine hells or the 666 abyssal layers or, uh, uh, or I can pull in any deity from any mythology. I can go to almost any time period in history. I, I, I can have a party of adventurers suddenly end up in Yankee Stadium in 1977, and they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Flashback like, of time bandits where they just walk through a door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, God, I love that movie, Time Bandits. Well, yeah, it's uh, a good movie. Uh, Ian Holm, of all people, is Napoleon. It, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, anyway, uh, but no, uh, moving on. Um, I'm sorry. I just, I, in theory, I disagree with Justin and uh, Evan about invent the RPG first. Um, I, I'm getting around to it. I mean, I've, <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, okay. I, I guess I, I, have a, I have a different perspective there. But gentlemen, I, I admire you both very intensely. James has always spoken extremely highly of both of you. I'm eager to read your stuff, and uh, I certainly hope you'll take a look at some of mine. Um, okay, oh, I've talked enough. Uh, what, of, course, next, uh, yeah. of course, you know uh, that, that you have converted D&D further from what D&D was for your books. You've pretty much owned it and made it your, your own. I mean, right. so you have to give yourself credit for that, that you have taken what was there picked it up on a pedestal and added to it and presented it to both your players and your readers. Right. And yeah, that, the Sabine dragons. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Hey, uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wonderful stuff out there. I, I mean, uh, uh, well, okay. I'm, I'm babbling now, but uh, <laughs> I, I want, I, I remember, um, I remember uh, no one, does, have you guys ever heard of the thieves world books? Robert oh. Aspirin and Lynn Abbey. Yeah. Boy, those, those were wonderful in the 80s. Those were one of the few books back then we had. <laughs> and so, I'm hurt that you would even have to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Justin, of course. You'd be familiar with the Thieves World books. And and these were written before Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, okay. But, uh, yeah. And uh, Well, anyway, again, there's so many wonderful books out there. Uh, of course, Tolkien, Narnia, oh God, the list goes on and on. Uh, I, 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 re I remember, I remember when, uh, when I finally got my first book out, I felt like king of the world. I was like, okay, I can die tomorrow. And some, some graduate student at the Library of Congress 500 years from now will find a copy of my book. <laughs> and for that millisecond, he's looking at it. <gasps> I will live again. That's <laughs> writing is immortality. What more motivation do you need? That, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> I got to say, though, speaking of a guy who knows his demographics, Laser Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what motivation? What more motivation do you need if you want to be immortal? <laughs> true. That is true. As the old uh, stories uh, back in Greece and Rome used to say, it's you suffer the true death if you are forgotten, forgotten. So, you know, uh, as a writer, Colonel, you never experience true death. Yeah. Colonel, Colonel William Travis, who defended the Alamo, said it best. Uh, One hour of crowded, glorious life is worth an age without a name. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So the next question I got you guys uh, is from a GM perspective, game master, storyteller, dungeon master, depending yeah. on which, which system we're talking about. What is your top tip for getting your players to write stories about your game? Like whether this is backstory or say you guys are doing a time jump in many games. It's a trick I, used to, I like to do in a lot of the games is we have the, okay, there's a, a one-year time skip as you guys get back together for your adventure in the next spring over winter. What is it you guys do? Like my best tip is bribe them with experience points, <laughs> offer them like a free level and say, you did this thing over winter because armies don't fight during the winter. What do you do? What uh, tips do you guys have? Justin, go I, first. Oh, yeah. uh, well, when it comes to firing the imagination of the gamers so that uh, they will actually write stories, uh, to tell you the truth, I have had very little success with that. The few people that I have known who did it 
we had quiet little meetings at the corner Starbucks, and they said, I'd really like you to see this. I want your feedback. If you tell anybody, I'll kill you. <laughs> and, okay, all right, that's that's fine. But what I learned over the decades about getting people to be so in, I- immersed into the game had everything to do with catering to two general proclivities. Over the years, I noticed that I could separate the the gamers at my table into two camps. You You had the people who wanted to be what they were not. And so you would have, you know, the, the high school sophomore with Coke bottle glasses and braces who is playing Nog the Barbarian who can break <laughs> dwarves before breakfast. OK, <laughs> that, that, that's fine. And, and and that is that is absolutely great, because for those few hours, those people, they are what they are not. And they find out. What are the limitations of that? And and if you're even handed with your GMing, they can find out that actions have consequences. Yes, break dwarf, go to jail. Okay, all right, fine. Don't we? we no, fine. Note to self: Don't do this. All right. Now there's the second camp. They still want to be what they are not, but they but they want to have some small slice of the character. Be like them. One of the very first modifications I ever made to good old first and second edition Dungeons and Dragons is that I included a crude, simple form of eyeglasses. Hmm. And and so there were people who, uh, you know, because they were so heavily influenced by the cartoon, they just had to be the wizard who wears glasses. <laughs> and, 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 and that had, that had some roots in their real life because they wore glasses. Mm-hmm. And now James already knows the story, but I'll, I'll tell you real quick. Anyway, translating this to gamma world, I had a good friend. I went to high school with him and his, his, his deepest, darkest inner secret is that he was mostly deaf in one ear he grew his hair long and he he grew his hair long to hide his over the ear hearing aid because they didn't make them to go in the ears back then and it was purely subconscious on my part i included a hearing aid on a random d20 loot table for gamma world that loot item came up one night and this guy basically, uh, uh, because he wanted that, he, his character that he was playing was not hard of hearing or deaf in any way, but that, that just the mere fact that that item that he was used to in the real world existed, he really, really wanted it. And he ended up sharing his secret with the other gamers at the table to the very best of my knowledge until we all graduated in 1984. They never, they, they never shared his secret with anybody. So that was that was a little bit of a connection. So when you read my post-apocalyptic fiction, yeah. in the novels, there tend to be visually impaired characters because I myself am legally blind. And I there are there, there there are there's always that one part in the story where the character turns the negative into the positive. And and I'm 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 making this point because uh, even though I myself have had no luck with getting other people to write uh, stories, at least nothing that they shared with anybody, nothing that they ever went on to publish. But I have also known people who, again, they were so invested in these games, they put me to shame when it comes to collecting notes. You know, I I, I come to the gaming table and I sit down and. I've got my folder with all my typed material and I've got my spiral notebook and I've got a pen and I'm ready to write. And there's three people sitting across from me and they've all got three ring notebooks mm-hmm. because, because they've, they, they, they've kept far more detailed notes than I ever did. And so whether it's the post-apocalyptic games or the old fantasy games, even traveler, you know, people, they'll, they'll, they'll flip open their notebook and they'll say, 
Um, back when we were in the town and we were talking to the guy and I saw him put the thing in the desk, third drawer from the right, I want to go back and speak to him. I want to know if he still has that thing available and will he part with it for a fair price? That's always magical when that happens. That's that is just magical. And that, that, that's, uh, as off topic as it is, that's my story. <laughs> Cool. That's really awesome, Justin. I, I really love the humanity in your story. You know, the the sort of the the relationships that you had had built with your players. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, well, well, thank you, thank you very much. I have I have thought for most of my life that people do the things that they do. We we in, in our in our real world lives, we're motivated for some reason that most often traces back to we, we, we just want to do the right thing. Now, sometimes people have interesting definitions of what the right thing is. Well, of course I should have all three cookies. I just killed the monster. What are you talking about? <laughs> but the monster but, was a good guy. Now. <laughs> well, he drew first. Very cool. Very, very awesome, Justin. Very awesome. So, so Evan, what tip do you have to get your players, you know, writing up stories, backstories, and such for their characters? Well, in contrasting um, in the, the way that Justin um, to- gave his tip, uh, I feel like Commander Data over here, because I have something that's a little bit, that's, has a little less humanity and a little less uh, interesting. Maybe he picked up, uh, you know, really good storytelling for being on the radio, but... Um, I liked when I try to get my players to play, I actually have wonderful success. Um, but the reason why is because I, at least I believe that when we play games, especially together, when we, we all have the same motivation to do it. And that is to be heard as the GM. We want to tell a story and we want to be heard. As the player, yes. we want to be part of that story. But as the player, we also want to be heard in our own unique way, different from the other players at the table, different from the GM. And so a lot of GMs are very, I'm the GM, I'm against the players. I'm not that way at all. I have been known to fudge roles because I'm trying to tell a story here, guys. <laughs> Yep. You know? <laughs> we are their yeah. biggest fan. We just don't want them to know that. Exactly. Right. So, you know, and um, what I do is, is uh, in teaching um, the, uh, the the Wongs actually came up with this, and uh, there are these teaching gurus that try to sell you their method of teaching. But what I picked up from them, yeah, was, teaching, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which I don't really agree with, but I did pick up things from these gurus. Mm -hmm. And one of them was something called a same side conversation. You have to realize that you and your players are on the same side. You're trying to have fun. And again, you're trying to be heard. Mm -hmm. So to get your players to write in your game, to expand your universe, first you got to realize that they're the ones who are writing the book anyway. You just built the world and set the setting. They're the ones writing that book. And I guess the, the, the best way is to have a same side conversation with, it. I call it a jam session. I sit down with each player and I talk, I, I get them passionate about their character in the setting that I've created. And that requires a pretty solid setting, but whatever it is, but you need to sit down with each player and hear them. Let them talk about what they want for their character. And when you do that, you can start writing with them, giving them ideas. And those ideas that they like and celebrating the ideas that they come up with will motivate them to be very passionate about your game. And that relates back to what I was talking to you before about that intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. It builds up that intrinsic motivation for each player to be able to do that. I want to come to game because I want to see how this story that I wrote with the GM plays out. And like you were saying before, Justin, there's the secret. Maybe I don't want to keep, maybe I want to keep that secret from the other players. 
And how long is that secret going to last? When is the GM going to reveal that I am the chosen one or I am the, the, uh, the whatever you've written for that character uh, that you wrote with them? Maybe there's more than one chosen one, and that's the plot. So you really have to sit down. You can't just tell your story. You have to tell the story that everyone at the table wants to play. Otherwise, go write a book. <laughs> that, that is a good one right there. You know, rather than running a game, write a book. <laughs> yeah. Because your players will derail the story nine out of ten times anyway. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 that, th- thank you very much, Evan. You you say, segued my comments here perfectly. Oh. Um, <laughs> now, exactly. Um, my books, I, I, I've, I've been blessed with wonderful players over decades, but my books have really blessed me. I get calls from people that I met at a convention two, three years ago. Hey, John, are you going to start a new D and D game? Can I play? And, and I'm like, and, uh, this, uh, okay. You, Evan, you were talking about ke- uh, carrot and stick before. Well, yeah. Uh, would you like your favorite character to uh, be in one my next book? Oh, okay. So, so let's sit down. Let's design your character. Let's figure out his back, his or her backstory. Let let's build this in and play play with this character as you want. And uh, we'll take certain encounters and certain situations and put them in the next book. And. Uh, the, the problem I've been having, and Justin talked about this earlier, the problem I've been having is like, uh, you know, oh, uh, can they be the star? Can they be the main character? And I'm like, well, no, but, uh, you know. Like, <laughs> but they're in the book. That's the important thing. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And I, I tell all of my players, every player starts off, they get one character in my books, you know. And then, then later on, I'm like, I, like I'll call up a friend that I uh, a friend that I've known for years. I'm like, hey, George, can I can I, remember that character you used back in Illinois? Can I use him in the next book? Sure, you know. It's like, so yeah, <laughs> carrot and stick. Now, um, motivation. I agree with both of you, Justin. Justin said it best, and Evan echoed it. Um, your te- the GM wants to tell a story, but the players are the story. You want to engage them. You want to, you, you, you want to get them into the story. You want them coming back next week like, oh, boy, what's going to happen next? And, uh, and uh, the, uh, what Evan said something about dice that was very interesting. Just this afternoon, I was playing D&D. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's kind of funny. Uh, at one point, uh, I uh, heard it a lot of uh, – city council members down into a basement while assassins were attacking the building and my party members were up on the first floor dealing with the assassins. Wouldn't you know, two assassins snuck into the basement. So my, my fifth level fighter had to take on two sixth level assassins. And let me tell you something. Thank God I, I rolled like three twenties, you know, with my attacks and stuff. If, if that did not happen, and my 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 dungeon master was like, I can't believe you rolled three twenties like that. And I'm like, well, there you go. You know, if, if it weren't for that, I would have died. I was I was brought down to three hit points. And I, you know what? I said to myself, you know what? My character is going to be in the next book. <laughs> <laughs> when you do something that epic, that tale needs to. I, be I'm told. sorry, I got I got disconnected there. Uh, uh, but yeah, the. When I when my my dungeon master was amazed, I was reduced to three hit points and could have died. And I'm thinking to myself this whole afternoon, this character is going into my next book. <laughs> and so, there there he, will be ballads spoken of his actions that day. Right. As a, as a matter of fact, the dungeon master pointed that out. The council members gave me a nice letter of thank you, and uh, I, I I'm going to somebody's going to make up a nickname for my characters oh, all right well, yeah and this reminds me when i play this is what i want my players to feel like so it's not just experience points and ah now here's here's the trap here's the trap every dungeon master has to avoid you don't want to be a monty hall player 
showering play, uh, uh, excuse me, Monty Hall Dungeon Master, showering players with tons of money and tons of magic items and, you know, oh, the third time we're playing, oh, yeah, you're seventh level, you're almost, you know, like, no, no, no. You don't want to be like that. But players get bored very quickly when they play four or five sessions and, oh, boy, they just got a plus one sword. Ooh. You know what I mean? So you want to avoid those extremes, okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, find that happy zone of sprinkling out the reward risk. Right. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, underlying all of that in my game is, okay, guys, Impress me, surprise me. That's the best way to get in my books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. I love that, John, because that's, you know, I, my my theory behind it all as a player is why should we, you know, how do we figure out how to get the dragon on the ground? No, no, no. We're going up there and we're going to fight <laughs> the dragon in the sky. Right. <laughs> Right, and, uh, and 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 who who knows? The lovely stewardess may give us some peanuts while while we're waiting. <laughs> In flight okay, movie, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean um, but yeah, the um, okay, the uh, the only other thing I wanted to say about this, um, okay, I wanted to talk about this more. I don't know if we have time for a big discussion, but I love alignments. I've known players uh, who hate alignments. They don't want anything to do with alignments. And I think alignments are so much fun. I mean, it's easy to play yourself when you're running a character, when you're playing a character. Mm -hmm. It's harder to take an alignment that you might not necessarily actually be like and, and then trying to play within those parameters. You're almost like acting. You're like, oh, well, uh, Oh yes, well, uh, sure. I I would I would I would I would never want to do something terrible like that. But then it's like, oh God, I want that treasure. <laughs> you know, like, you know, or you know, like, or you know, the, the old joke with my friends and I were: no matter what character classes we all played, we were all thieves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, alignments they, are a good measuring stick for your players for character growth too. I mean. Yes. Because, you know, it can always be – it's great when you have a player who really gets into their character and they know to do this is breaking their alignment and they're actually saying at the game table, I would love to do this, but my character probably wouldn't. And that's right. – that that comes in one of those magic tricks of the – what when the person stops playing the game and the character is playing the game, the game you know. Yes. When your player yeah. has now separated the consciousness in their mind that is their character from right. Joe Schmo, everyday person. Right. You know, there's nothing cooler than when someone sits there literally gnashing their teeth going, I want to do this thing, but oh, my paladin so-and-so would let the bad guy surrender just because you know he'll go to Arkham and he'll escape again, <laughs> and the yeah. cycle will start all over again. But because he surrendered and offered some kind of reward right. for surrender, he yes. will not murder him. And then, of course, yes. you get great player-on-player conflict that can happen from that of the mm-hmm. ranger puts an arrow in him. Will the paladin roll initiative to see if he can stop the arrow from hitting him in the heart? <laughs> right. and, and one other thing I want to point out, too. How can you have a party nemesis? Okay? Mm-hmm. How can you have a party nemesis if he, keep, if he gets killed too quickly? The, you know? the, the yeah. super villain yeah. kill off, you know, for the yeah, villain of exactly. the week, because yeah. much yeah. much yeah. like the Marvel comic universe movies, we never see repeat villains. They right. keep killing most of them off. Right. Yeah. I, I I want. I don't know if I, you guys can see this on Skype here. This is my fourth book, Academic Mayhem, and I have marvelous artists, uh, Chris Ennett and David Delante. They they are Marvel, DC, Zenoscope, Dark Horse comic book artists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, well, anyway, it's here, sexy the, art. Yes. Uh, and by the way, one one thing I've never liked about Tolkien. Do you know? How, is, do you know how hard it is to find sex in Tolkien? My <laughs> God. Sa- Samwise Gamgee has thirteen children with Rose Cotton, and no one would know that unless you read the appendix at the end of the Return of the King. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I love relationships. I mean, hey, if I'm a wizard, 
of course I'm going to want to bedazzle a supermodel. And, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know and like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah sweetie, uh, you're going to be my assistant. You know, like, uh, oh, I mean, okay, yeah, but whatever. Anyway, this picture, I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, this is Princess Cindy Medford, a chaotic good wizard. She she finds, she doesn't realize it, but she finds a lovely helm. It's meant for fighters, but she playfully puts it on her head. How did she know it was a helmet of opposite alignment? <laughs> and you can see her clothing is changing from a, a, a chaotic good wizard to a much more uh, sexy, provocative, lawful, evil. <laughs> and, and her whole personality changes. And then she actually she actually ends up killing her, killing two of her sisters to try to seize control of Palomar. And would, would would Cindy Medford have done this at the beginning of the book? No. <laughs> <laughs> she goes from from T- Taylor from uh, He Man to Evil Lynn. Yes. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and oh god, and uh, uh, my 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 fifth book. I'm sorry, I'm blatantly promoting myself. My fifth <laughs> book, which is harder to find since it's not on Amazon yet. It will be very soon. Uh, my fifth book is based on a song by Paula Abdul, Opposites Attract. Well, (laughs) who would ever think that a gallant, heroic, chivalrous, lawful good paladin would fall and and an evil, wicked, sexy, seductive, anti-paladin, who would think they'd fall in love? (laughs) Oh, like nobody ever fell for the bad girl. Yeah, right. (laughs) Right. And no good girl ever fell for the bad guy. This is this is a yeah. classic writing historical thing, you know. As, again, I, uh, I I have a blast with uh, with, with how, uh, I, I have a blast with uh, alignments and moral dilemmas. And gee, you mean all I have to do is kill all I have to do is kill my girlfriend's father to take the throne? Gee, I wonder if I should or not. You know, I mean, <laughs> now. My books are not quite like Game of Thrones. I say this all the time. I I, I don't kill off all the characters. You see, I, I I actually have happy endings once in a while. It's not, it's not. You know, I mean, it's not all doom, gloom, and despair. And oh my God, I'm gonna die in the way I feared the most. No, 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 no. Uh, but yes, I I I I, uh, I have great fun with my books, and that spills over into my games. And yes, I'm using 5th edition D&D now with a few modifications. I I still use 1st edition AD&D psionics, the best psionics you'll find mm. in any of the editions. And I think uh, okay, I I'm I'm talking way too much and digressing. Um uh, where should I end? <laughs> what was okay. the topic again? <laughs> so uh... My next question for you guys, I'll, I'll make it a two-parter, which will make it interesting. So this is purely put your writer's cap on, not your GM cap. Okay. So for somebody who wants to start writing some kind of fiction as a writer, A, what is their f- best way to get started? You know, what is the kick them in the ass, shut up, and start typing tip? And when inevitably they lose that first gust of steam and momentum, what is the best way to get back on track after you get derailed by, by either writer's block or something in life happens? Because we all know life comes up and gets kicks you off that keyboard more often than not. Yes. So we'll go ahead and uh, start with Justin. Okay. First and foremost, before you ever develop any evil commercial plans to dominate the world, write for yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, right now, this moment, I think there might be eh, realistically three different people I hear from. They occasionally email me some stuff, and and I I've known them long enough. I can say, dude, that 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 sucks. Call the hazmat team. This is terrible. <laughs> um, and 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 they you know they 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 know I'm not trying to drive a cold steel spike through them. They'll 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 take it. And, you know, sometimes uh, I, I've known these people long enough. If they want to know why, I think it's like that. They'll they'll say, OK, tell me. And if they don't want to know, they'll just go and they'll they'll deal. OK, so rule one, write for yourself. Rule two, do not, do not, do not 
judge yourself against anybody else. Do not measure yourself against anybody else. I don't care if you love Stephen King. Don't try to be like him. I don't care if you love Tolkien. Even though it's none of your damn business who has sex with whom, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you don't, don't, don't measure yourself against these people, especially people who have been in the business longer than you've been alive. It's just, it's not going to happen. If you think about this as one rule for each hand, you can, you can stay in balance. And then the last of it is to think long term. Because the terrible truth is the overwhelming majority of people listening to us right now, 99% of them were not college trained. So there's a lot of stuff they don't know. They're going to, they're, they're going to do it their way, whether they intended to do it their way or not. They're going to, they're, they're going to bootstrap. They're going to do it by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That's fine if your story that you work so hard on is only a page and a half long that's it that's what it is yep. if it's 10 pages then that's exactly what it is you got to remember that this is your own personal laboratory you can close the windows you can draw the curtains you can lock the door you can burn the place to the ground as many times <laughs> as you want and <laughs> nobody will ever know and when it is time for you to go to somebody you can trust and say, hey, um, hey, Justin, I see that you have done this kind of thing before. I want to do something like this, but uh, still taking embryonic steps here. So, you know, what do you think now? So the people out there, if any of your friends, your pals, your colleagues come to you and they show you their first time effort take the boots off take the gloves off sit down fill your lungs with air and be, be merciful because your first impulse is going to be to speak to them with your 10 plus years of experience and from their point of view a 500 ton safe has just fallen off the empire state building and killed them without mercy so avoid that. Don't do that. <laughs> You've hit them so right. hard, their honorable ancestors felt it. Yeah. yeah indeed. So don't. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> you know, you, th that's, that's my caveat to the whole thing. So write for yourself. Don't judge yourself against anybody else. Don't measure yourself against anybody else. And just think long term. If it takes you three, five, ten years to learn how to do this, then then that's exactly what it takes. I mean, once upon a time, just to, uh, uh, just, just, just to uh, uh, follow the example of my colleagues here and to expound on my past a little bit, before, this is before I got the idea to, to, to develop the post-apocalyptic role-playing game, I knew I was going to be a writer from age six on. Hmm. So in uh, it was about October 1983. The legendary Anne McCaffrey mm. comes to our school as a guest lecturer, and I'm sitting there in the in, in the second row, and 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 she says, "Is there somebody named Justin Oldham here?" And I'm thinking, "Oh God, what have I done? What do I do? Uh, this is uh, you know not not." Because you know, the last thing you want to do is come to the attention of accomplished master. <laughs> so, like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. She walks over to the edge of the stage. She looks down at me, and she says, "I hope you're not planning on writing anytime soon." Uh, uh, no, 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 ma'am. I was, uh, um, was thinking about living a little first. And she says, "That's that's very good. I didn't come to writing until later in life, and." Somehow I think the maturity will do you some good. And then she went back to the podium and, <laughs> and, and, and it went on. Okay. You know, it, it, it made, it made the point to me while she was telling her, her life story. And, and, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, I, I, I came to all this later in life because I wanted to go out. I wanted to make mistakes in life and I wanted to do other things so that I could come to this with a, with a breadth of experience. Mm -hmm. So if you're out there right now, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're thinking about writing a story, do it. 
Just do it for the reasons you want to do it. Don't try to be like anybody else and take your time. Mm-hmm. That's that's a great one. I, I want to interject real quick because a lot of folks don't realize the contemporary great writers wrote little newspaper mini stories, little little mm-hmm. anthologies, and then those anthologies were recreated in their novels. So yeah. just by getting the story out on paper, you can always revisit it and retouch it, you know, which and that's a great mm-hmm. tip is just get it on paper. Mm-hmm. That That is a great mm-hmm. tip. Absolutely. That way, too, in case you had writer's block, you can go back to the old file and reread it and say, hey, change the names. This story element is perfect for this other character and put it into another story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. most game masters do all the time. But we don't tell them that. <laughs> now, but, yeah. right, writer's block is a separate topic, and I have a separate answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, how, Justin, um, how do you get back into writing when you get thrown off, though? Well, first, let me uh, let me uh, tell on myself a little bit. Ever since the day I could walk, I have always had the bad habit of being obsessively single minded. So when I say I'm going to do something, what I'm really saying is I promise to the heaven and the earth and the stars above whoever hears me that I shall do this unto death. Okay, that's that's really what I mean. But if I say, you know, yeah, I'm going to go do it, then I I, I tend to be uh, unhealthfully fixated on, uh, on, on my goals and... The other thing I do is I have always believed that uh, just in the same way you can wreck your body physically uh, because, you know, you, you, you work, you run, you play, you do sports, and then you go out and be a lumberjack. Okay, by the time you're 35, you can barely walk. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the same way that you can wreck your body by too much work, too much play, you can destroy your mind. By, 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 by forcing it to do when there's just no energy left in there. There's no creativity left in there. So for most of my writing life, I stick to a fairly rigid word count for most of the year. Most of the year, I write 150, or excuse me, 1500 words a day. And, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but it adds up real fast. And then for about three months a year, which is uh, which is basically November, December, and January, then I allowed my I'll allow myself to be a speed demon, and I'll do three thousand words a day, and then I'll, I'll I'll slow down again. And even though I do have the impulse in there, do more, go faster, kill. <laughs> okay, uh, you know it, it 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 it. I have learned how to develop the willpower. To, uh, to, to, to keep the, you know, keep the racing beast in check so that now until the day I choose to retire, there, there, there's still some energy left in the tank. And the, the, the one thing that will throw me is when the carefully laid out plan, uh, turns into a dead end story. And mm. that, that, that's demoralizing, but all I do is hate myself for two or three days and get back to it. <laughs> I know how that feels. <laughs> Give yourself some oh. time to get some of those spell slots back. I, 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 I'm just jumping in here and saying it. I call it my muse. When my muse is screaming at me, I, I can write chapters overnight and pull a book together really quickly. When my muse is asleep, <laughs> I, I, I have to kick it once in a while. Come on, come on, get going. <laughs> come on, wake up. <laughs> wake up. Yes, but if you had to de- if you had to describe your your muse, what would it be? And I'll I'll just I'll, I'll start by telling you my muse is the evil voice that speaks in the darkness. <laughs> it says, "Yes, you could if he was that kind of nice guy, but because we both know he's not, he'll use the smaller knife with the more toxic poison." <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's how my, that's how my muse tends to work. So if you had to characterize your muse, 
what would you say it is? And that my, that's my question for both of you. Uh, may, may I? I don't want to jump in front of you, Evan. Oh, Honestly, boy. okay, my muse, forgive me, is a very sexy, sultry, lovely lady. <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, I mean, it's hard to imagine, but she's like, uh, she's like, John, you promised you need to get this done. Or why don't you, why don't you do, why don't you put, a, why don't you put a little romance in there, or a little sex or a little violence or th- other things that make life fun, you know, like a little greed, a little, uh, a, a little, yeah. and I, I hear this beautiful, lovely enchantress, if you will, kind of muse. Um, I, I mean, again, uh, not, uh, no, no one, is, no one has encouraged me or belittled me or cr- or crushed me more than lovely ladies. So I mean, uh, I, I, um, I, I, I hear, I hear a lovely lady voice as my muse, and um, well, okay, I, I probably said too much, Evan. <laughs> no, it's all right. You know, I. For my muse, um, if I were to describe describe it, it um, sort of whatever it wants to be. It, it's in fact that's the reason why I took one of the reasons why I took on the handle of Maverick. It's because I've got this voice in my head that just I mean, it's not a real voice, obviously. <laughs> I have this this sort of this this desire to write an adventure. <clears throat> you know, I get. I guess it's a, a little bit of boredom. Like, come on, let's go on an adventure. Let's, you know, let's let's go have a go play in the Star Wars universe for a little bit. Let's go, uh, let's go into just some sandbox where I can do stuff I can't do every day that I would love to do, but I can't because I'm stuck making awesome products. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know that's. Uh, to sort of, you know, get back on track and answer his question, it sort of, here's the truth. I actually have autism. I have Asperger's. Uh, communication, socializing, that kind of stuff, uh, I'm a little behind the curve on. I had to, I guess, to touch on some of the things Justin was talking about. I had to grow into it. I didn't, um, when I was six years old, I wanted to be a scientist to help people. Um, turns out games are the best way to do that and write writing stories and things like that. And to be honest, I really enjoyed listening to you guys. I wanted to hear what you had to say. Uh, you're my superiors in this, in this respect. Um, We're all equal. I, uh, and though I don't compare myself to anyone, I still have this sense of imposter syndrome, which is, if you don't know what that is, it's a psychological term for, when you're like, okay, when is everybody going to find out that I'm not as good as they are, you know, that I don't belong in this interview. Uh, <laughs> but it's because I started off when I was nine years old and I started writing uh, for school, really. I didn't write for myself. Um, I could write a whole book in a paragraph. I was known for that. Uh, I could write a few sentences. That was the story. See you later. I'm done. You know? <laughs> Project and, done. Um, yeah. I took on the challenge of of being able to write because I got into Dungeons and Dragons, because I wanted to be a GM and I wanted to tell my story. I wanted to be heard, and Jeez. I got better and better at writing. And as I became a teacher, I learned about this uh, this doctor. Her name is Carol Dweck. And she comes, she came up with this idea called fixed mindset versus growth mindset. And I'll let you guys kind of look that up on your own. It's, it changed my life. Mm-hmm. And I, my recommendation to those of you watching that want to write is to just do it. Okay. Yeah. The first thing you're going to come out with is going to be bad. It's going to be bad. It's not going to be good, but you got to get that out of the way. And failure is okay. Yes. Failure is not what defines you. It's how you deal with that failure that defines you. Right. And so, you know, get the get those embarrassing stories out. Play into those tropes that are so trite. You know, get them out of your system. And then you're going to start growing. And I have a unique position where 
I'm, I feel my, I feel as a writer, I'm okay. That I'm sort of developing my style as a writer and my voice, but I get to, I have a team of writers that work with me. Some of them are far more experienced while others, they're just fresh out of college and I can see myself in them, but I can also see myself in those who are superior to me. And it kind of gives me, it's just an interesting perspective to see. Um, and that's why I was really interested in hearing how you guys about your muses, about how you guys kick yourself in the pants, because as a, as a business owner, a small business owner, I find myself busy all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. constantly finding excuses for why I can't write. Because for me, writing is, it's fun. It's this sort of, it's, I go have an adventure, you know? And um, it's hard for me to justify that because, well, I, you know, I got to get that email that, I got to get that uh, invoice out to so-and-so. I got to respond to this customer's questions. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to, got to, got to, got to, got to. And, um, it's I don't cut out enough time for myself. And that's something that I've had to learn how to do is you guys have what you call as a muse. I call the madness. I just I get this inspiration. I got to get it out. I got to write it. I got to you know, this is the best story I've come up with in years. I got to get it down before I forget. Um, and so when I to get back into writing excuse me, to get back into writing after having to write emails and invoices, <clears throat> the best, the best thing I can do is to make sure uh, that I allow myself to have fun, that I don't question myself and say, you know what, my writing isn't worth it um, because it is, it's yes. part of what my business is. And it's, um, you know, and what I would say to the, the our viewers would be is your writing is worth it, too, even if it is bad, even if it is your starting point, it's worth it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I would, let me let me add on one more thing to that. The reason why I think it's worth it is because every person has an intrinsic value. Uh, and I hate to sound like Mr. Rogers here, but no one else can be you. No one else can be you. No one else can write that story other than you. That's a good point. Amen. Yep. Amen. Um, you, uh, you, you, I, I think you guys are wonderful. I, I admire you both very much. And uh, I, I think one of the reasons why I'm having fun here this last hour and 41 minutes is that, <laughs> uh, is that because we're all equal and we all have different perspectives. Now, uh, to answer your questions, James, the two questions. Number one, how do I get started writing? Well, I actually enjoy it. For me, it's fun. And now I'm, I'm currently at a job where I'm on the phone and I'm staring at a computer for eight and a half hours every single day. Then to go, then to go home and then, well, I'm working from home now with the coronavirus, but uh, I don't have the coronavirus. I just mean with the crisis. But then to stop that, get on a computer, stare at a computer and type, you got to love what you're doing. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, now, that's true. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, what, what get, what I tell people when they tell me they want to start writing, I say, great, start writing. Just get your thoughts down. You can always go back and proofread and have somebody else proofread for you to improve it, streamline it. And that's the hardest part of writing. People, uh, they, they write, they pour their heart into their huge manuscript. It's perfect. It's wonderful. Can't we just publish it the way it is? Uh, no. <laughs> You've got to have people, to, uh, not yourself. You've got to have other people to proofread it. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, what you thought was perfect might not make any sense if you read it aloud. So, again, yeah. the, the hardest thing for any writer is to, <clears throat> is to let go of your draft and turn it over to the editors, who will then uh, tear it apart, shrink it, mercilessly tear into it and rewrite it and show you. I love my publisher. 
And uh, Patty, if you'll come over here and just say hi. Get over here, Patty. Come on. I love my publisher for this reason. You see, she taught me how to take four pages of draft, reduce it down to two or three paragraphs, and not lose a single bit of content or in, or what I wanted to get across to the readers. Now, everybody, I don't know if you can Hi. see her here. This Hi, is Patty. Patty Holstrand. How are you doing? Doing good. And, uh, and Patty taught me how to edit what I write. Which is and an it, art form all of its own. Yeah, yes. and you, mm -hmm. everybody should do this. And it's the hardest thing in the world to let go of that perfect manuscript you poured your heart into to, 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 to the editors. But, okay, so that's number one. Number two, when I hit that roadblock, when I'm like, gee, I'm not sure what to do next, that's when I, gra that's when I start going through history. Uh, I actually keep a little notebook and a file on my computer looking for good quotes. Uh, if I see a good quote about Abraham Lincoln or a fun quote from a movie that I, I love or something, I put it down there and I review my quotes and I'm like, hey, that gives me an idea for a chapter. <laughs> you know? um, I will say this also, those dusty old history books that uh, people found so boring in high school, my gosh, they're wonderful. It's a treasure trove. I, I, I mean, p pick a different topic, you'll find something. Now, one other thing I want to say about Patty, and, and yes, she's, she's hoping she's escaping here, but no. <laughs> one other thing I wanted to say about Patty is that uh, I think it's so much better to find a publisher than to self-publish because Patty – Gave me a gave she gave me a sheet of paper once, one thousand things you had to consider, or what, however many it was, several hundred, whatever, several hundred things you had to consider when you're writing a book, and you know this does it's not just writing the book, the copyrights, the the fonts, the uh, the spacing of the lines between lines in the book, you, are, are the, the what? Letting. The letting, yeah. yeah. You, uh, do you want the you, you want to avoid the you want to avoid the book uh, going down into the crack? You know the the words going the down into what, the margins. Yeah, all this stuff you got to think about. And uh, Patty got me to focus on on you know being systematic with all of this. I mean, the, it's the science the, behind the art, right? And put it another way, writing the book writing the book in draft that's the easy part. <laughs> and then once you get the book published and printed there the fun really starts marketing marketing <laughs> advertising i i'm devastated after five years my GoDaddy website finally got shut down i uh five years ago i got one of those five pay this and you're good for five years well now they want like five times what I paid the last time. So uh, I'm, I'm looking into Wix. I'm looking into other uh, website. Hey, uh, I, I can help you out with that, John. Um, ah, I, I know a lot of people who can help you out with that. So Ooh, see, really? see why I want to bring you guys together? Because uh, <laughs> writing, much like music, is great when you can have jam sessions with folks, especially when everybody does a different genre. So that way you can actually talk openly and freely. Right. Well, I would like to underline something that John said about those old dusty books. I write mostly sci fantasy. Um, with, I mean, it's multiverse, so it's, it, it goes into everything. But yeah, the, the truth is, is that a lot of my lore, even though it's based in science, calls back to a lot of mythology and a lot of history. Um, it, 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 that, Public domain is a treasure trove of yes. stuff. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's it's I mean, like even ga Game of Thrones. I've joked with so many friends who aren't history buffs. Of I can quote which book and which chapter is taken from where in history in yeah. Europe. You know. <laughs> I can do that too. And George Martin took so much from the War of the Roses in England. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, yeah. But again, uh, absolutely and. Uh, Again, I'm delighted to meet you guys, uh, just, Justin and, uh, and Evan. And, of course, J James discovered me. He discovered me, what, four or five years ago at 
Tucson Comic Con. Kind of quite a while back, yeah. And uh, J- J- James has uh, been very encouraging, and I, I'm I'm very flattered and honored to uh, be able to yap tonight. Thank you. Hey, I mean, <laughs> fantasy books good. based on D&D. No, that's totally something I wouldn't be interested in. Yeah. Just like apocalyptic RPG ba- with apocalyptic books read. No, totally something I would not be interested in. No. <laughs> you know, I'm glad, Pat, I'm glad Patty's sitting here. I wish she heard you guys say earlier – Write the RPG game first, then write the novels. I, but but we, we, I mean, sooner or later, I may do an R, RPG game. I, I'm thinking about it. I mean, I, and, you know, I, I've got some wonderful maps, guys. Um, uh, I will – oh, James, James mentioned the Arizona Fantasy Gaming Association. More importantly, and James will agree – Check out my Dungeon Masters Secret Society. Oh, on Facebook. On, your, your Facebook on group, Facebook. Yep. Dungeon Masters I, Secret Society. I would love to. I created something a long time ago very similar to that. To that. So I would I would love to check that out. Because uh, Game Masters need to have their own support groups, damn it. Yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> and, and believe it or not, we, we – I only started this group like six months ago. We've got we've got over fifteen hundred members already. Oh, that's impressive! We, wow. We, we, we've had debates on miniatures, alignments, how to handle difficult players. Uh, how, you know, I have an idea for an encounter. How can I spruce this up? I mean, uh, oh God! How can you add plus one to that awesome encounter? Yeah, and uh, uh, again, I'll I'll uh, I'll send you guys links. But, uh, okay. Um, May I actually uh, yeah. interject something? I wanted to, before we move on too much, um, I wanted to kind of touch on something. Another another thing that uh, John had spoken about was about editors and, and that, that it's hard, the hardest thing to um, kind of hand over. And so w- I talked about Dr. Um, Aaron McDonald and sort of mm-hmm. handing over my science war to her. Uh, that was terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. I'm a science teacher, so I take a little bit of pride in my yeah. understanding of science. But this was quantum mechanics in a world that isn't real. Yes. <laughs> so yes. I, I this is totally new territory for me. And I got uh, some of the best compliments from my editor because she was basically editing the science. And just, wow, uh, she really liked my warp drive. Right. Um, I, I, I call it realistic fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> the, the more real is it, the more realistic, the more it makes sense, the more fun it is. Yeah. But the more yeah. careful you have to be. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I, I can proudly say uh, the, uh, uh, one last thing I wanted to add following up on exactly what Evan was saying. I envy your science background, Evan. Um, well, you, you've got to be able to pa- – my books can pass the geek test. Uh, you consistency. <laughs> if I say that Colonel Armand is 24 years old in chapter two, and then later on uh, he says I enlisted in the Imperial Guard four years ago, well, if it comes up, yes, he was 20 years old when he enlisted. <laughs> you know, you got to be this. You got to be consistent. You got to you got to pass that geek test. You never know when someone's going to ask you. <laughs> At a convention, what what about that character that you said this, but you had said this at another point? Is which is right? <laughs> you got to be consistent. And then they'll follow up consistently on a forum publicly somewhere. I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, which so that Paul, definitely goes let, back to the feedback. Yes. Well, hey, oh, John, let let me ask you one question. I'm just curious to know because I have I have to. I have to contend with, uh, with with similar readers. Do you index your work? No, you don't need that. We don't. I don't. I don't index my work, but uh, I I try to draw timelines as I'm writing. So if I say three months later in chapter four, uh, uh, correction. If, if chapter four is set in uh, in November, and I say three months later in chapter five. Well, I can't have chapter six suddenly set in January. I got to make sure it's uh, I got to make sure it's uh, in April or May, you know again. So I do not index my work. But uh, Laura Thompson and I, my friend in Illinois, she and I, we we do these timelines through the whole book, so we can uh, make sure that everything is 
consistent and the, uh, too much time doesn't get away from us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that means your writing style is you're an outliner. You like that, yeah. that timeline outline to, to keep you in track. Right. But, ah, but this is very important. You got to get it all down in draft first. Get it all down in draft. Then when you're proofreading it, then do the timeline. And you can say, wow, that chapter four and chapter six don't connect. I need to redo that timeline. I need to straighten. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah, um, the, 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 and oh, the, the fi uh, to finally answer Jason's question. What, what motivates me when I'm, when I get writer's block? I just grab a dusty old book or I just grab, or I look back into history and I try to and I try to say, OK, what would be really dramatic here? What would really shake up the story? Uh, no, I don't automatically kill someone. But, uh, you know, like, all right, let's put let's put a unexpected character into an unexpected situation. <laughs> and then well, all of a sudden step back and watch what happens. Right. <laughs> That's, that's that's one of the nice things with your character development is once you have a character set, you know how they're going to respond. Like right. like, right. like players in RPGs, you know their character. Yep. One one other secret I'll reveal: in every book I do, I have an idea of the ending. I know how I want it to end with a big climactic whatever, and uh, I try to build the story toward that ending. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I know I know there are hundreds of debates on this. Some people write the story as they go. Other people uh, they start writing a story and then by the time they get to the end, it is nothing. It's nothing what they originally thought or whatever. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I I try to have a try to see their pants. Yeah, see to their pants. I try to have a clear idea of where I want to end. Well, you know, are 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 are, are the are the baboons that were experimented on, do they go nuts and start killing everybody? Or uh, do, do we have a big sea fight? Or do we have two dragons battling in the sky? Or, oh, my God, do we attack the nine hells dimensional planes? Or, uh, you know, or, or oh, my God, we, we got a lovely civil war here. Uh, who, uh, who, who's going to win out? You know, all this stuff I try to plan out in advance where I want to end. And then, mm -hmm. then I had work toward that. Or you yeah, just pick all three. Uh, <laughs> right. Anyway, uh, I, I, I've used up my section. Uh, who's next? What's next, James? <laughs> so uh, pretty much that, that covered the topics that I had for this jam session. It sounds like we definitely need, like, I'm thinking an entire one just for writer's block, but that's just me. Or whatever topic we come up with next, because I know you guys want to hang out some more, because I, I know I want to hang out with you guys some more. That'd be awesome. Sounds good to me. Well, so, I'm, I, yeah, I'm trying to see how I can get down to Tucson. I just hope they have a convention in November. Yeah, <laughs> sadly, everything is convention. still up in the air for everything. <laughs> but yeah. then again, you know, I'd rather be safe than sorry. You know, 2021 is going to be the year of the, co the convention comebacks. Yeah. Because yeah. in 2020, we don't want to catch the con crud that's going around right now. Yes. Yeah. It's not yeah. a week of being sick. It's something far more serious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. to pretty much wrap up, we'll go ahead and go one by one with you guys. Where can folks find you online and find your work online? I think we've kind of mentioned it, but we'll put it at the end just to make sure it's there so folks can make sure to type it in their Google machine before they, you know, finish listening and wrap this up. So Justin, go ahead and go first. Okay, well, if you want to know about me specifically, you can go to justinoldham.com. I made that deliberately difficult so that nobody could remember it. <laughs> and if you want, if you want to know more about the game specifically, you can go to acaftercollapse.com. And for those of you on a budget, we have more than 30 items that are downloadable for free, if that Ooh. motivates you. Yeah. And if you want to know about the business side of the operation, you can go to shadowfusionbooks.com. And yes, before you say it, many people have told me in the last few years, it sounds like a heartless corporation. And that was the point. <laughs> Either it. that or it's a false flag shadow organization. One or the other. Can neither confirm nor deny. Right. <laughs> Well, what I can confirm is uh, 
that I just launched my website. Uh, yeah. So I'm really excited. Um, we've been, uh, had a huge troubles with it, but it finally came out. Um, so basically, if you're curious about what I'm doing and curious about, you know, what what's new and, you know, different products and stuff that I do, you can, you know, you can find us at uh, Paradigm Store, Paradigm Lost Store. Dot com. And I'll spell that out for you. <laughs> uh, P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M-L-O-S-T-S-T-O-R-E.com. I know that's a mouthful and that most of the letters in the al- alphabet are in there. Basically, uh, you can find all the new stuff that I'm going to be doing. Um, you know, the Kickstarter was meant to start the business, not, you know, just kickstart a single product. So we have books already that are free for download we also have uh, pre-order dice so once we fulfill the kickstarters you can get your you know if you missed out on the kickstarter you can get those recipes um and sort of an exclusive for james here but uh i'm also going to be moving into metal dice recycling stuff and um i would like to underline that uh a lot a lot of my products are designed for in-game you know, gaming, and I realize that that's sort of not, uh, I guess, too popular right now. <laughs> but um, a lot of it goes to supporting. We're, we're going to be starting kind of a nonprofit sort of thing, mm-hmm. where some of my products were designed to help people in hospitals play role-playing games. Uh, so, like for instance, my dice roller will help you, you know, roll dice in a hospital bed or on a small table. It also helps children uh, keep their dice on the table. So maybe you can bring your kids in on the games while you're stuck inside. <laughs> and cool. for road trips. Yeah. He's got this really great hamster ball dice roller that you can roll on any surface and get your oh, dice wow. to actually come up as a result. Cool. It's like a weeble wobble. It's like a physics toy. Yeah. Cool. Weebles wobble, <laughs> but the dice don't nope. fail. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, well, go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, as I said, my my five year old website just came down last month, so I'm redesigning my website now. But all is not lost. You can find my books on Amazon in the books department. Go to books when you go to Amazon.com. Just go to the books department. Type in my name, John Paul R I E D. John Paul Reed. John with an H. You will find four of my five books. My fifth book will be up on Amazon very, very soon and the Kindle edition. And uh, my sixth book, I hope, will be out uh, certainly before the holidays, uh, uh, October. And um, uh, another way to contact, uh, you can also contact me anytime via Facebook. I even have a I even have a fan group on Facebook for people who've read my books. I'm proud to say. And my my publisher keeps telling me uh, I've only been writing books now for five years and I have five books out, but I've sold over 5000 of them. So she keeps telling me for a brand new author who just got started and is just building readership. I'm doing great. You know, I'm, <laughs> but uh, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I was J.K. Rowling yet. <laughs> so, People ask me all the people ask me all the time. So do you want to be like J.R.R. Tolkien? And I'm like. No way. And they're like, why not? J.R.R. Tolkien's estate has made more money since his death than when he was alive. I'd rather, That's true. <laughs> I'd rather be like I'd rather be like J.K. Rowling. I want to be alive to enjoy my billions. <laughs> 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 I, I, I can't wait. I can't wait for Stevie. I mean, Steven Spielberg. I can't wait for old Stevie to call me with the three movie contract deal. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but okay but yes you can you can find my books on amazon you can find them on facebook all else sales you can contact me and as soon as i can get with evan uh i, I i'll i want to get a new website up and running very shortly and uh i even have an executive board i want to thank everyone on the palomar and adventures llc executive board that's my marketing company yes i created my own llc Legal Zoom is wonderful. They'll get you set up, and uh, everything. Everything is a, uh, you know, you can you can find me all these different ways. And uh, 
Well, uh, I just want to thank James. James, I want to thank you so very much again for putting this together for us. This has really been a joy and a lot of fun. And uh, I, uh, Evan, Justin, I'm delighted to meet you guys. I'll even send you. I'll even send you some links and info as soon as we get off here on Facebook. Okay. Awesome. awesome. I look forward to it. It was really nice to meet both of you. Yes, I'm glad to meet both of you too. Hey guys, I'm just glad that all three of you were free today so we could all get together and hang out and just do this yep. jam session, which I've, I've promised folks because with the whole gaming online now, only we, everybody's in like total lack of contact. <laughs> I figured this is something that we need to do more often of getting to chat with everybody online because like with, with John, we normally meet at the conventions that go on. You know, that's, it's the yeah. convention circuits. Like this week would have been yeah. Phoenix Fan Fusion. Yes, it would have. And we would have been up in Phoenix this weekend. But as the case may be, you know, I still don't know what the rest of the year's convention circuit looks like. So this way, at least we can all keep in contact and I can get to, you know, other folks to mesh with each other because it's all about everybody creating cool stuff and rifting off each other. You know, it's it's yes. collaborative, creative energy feeds off of each other. You know, it's, yeah. and that's one of those things that if why not share good things? You know, if I like something... Obviously, I'm going to share it because somebody else may see this and go, hey, I like this thing. Thanks for sharing it. Yep. And well, I like you guys. What can I say? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have a question for you. If we, if this is something we would like to continue, um, I thought maybe it would be interesting to get all of our collective fans to maybe uh, ask us some questions that they may want answers to. That they didn't, you know, they may, James is such a great moderator that, you know, he'd be able to sift through them or, you know, there's live streaming that people can ask questions with. It's yeah. something to consider. I mean, if you guys want to, you know, pass along, my email is creativeplaypodcastnet at gmail.com. And if you yeah. just have them subject, you know, questions for so-and-so, I will by all means be willing to share that out to you guys. I mean, I was going to send out a Facebook post today, but apparently today was a busy day, as apparently three-day yeah. holidays still become, even when you're trapped at home. Yeah. <laughs> so that way folks could drop any questions for you guys. But definitely I'll be able to point back to this podcast episode and say, hey, got some of the guys coming back, you know, because we may secretly be having another get-together tomorrow with some of you guys that are free tomorrow to talk about another subject with another writer that I've got on, on track that couldn't make it tonight. So we can talk about another topic secretly tomorrow that will probably be posted a week later than this episode, which I'm aiming to post on Tuesday. I, I got I got to work tomorrow. But, I know. Uh, I, I, I could do it in the evening after 7 p.m. my uh, Arizona time. But. Okay, but yeah, we can definitely set some up. See what see, do like a poll to see what the the most interesting question is we want to talk about. Because because trust me, between the three of you guys, there's a mountain of different perspectives, history, and skill that is just an awesome collection between role playing and writing. Yes. And like tomorrow, a friend of ours, Deborah, I wanted to get her on the line because she actually has published a RPG that her husband, before he passed away, wrote and produced. Hmm. But she's basically carrying his dream on by getting his RPG out there. So, and she's she's great people, just wow. like you guys. That's awesome. I love that. Well, gosh, uh, again, have a good have a good night, everyone. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you have a good night. I appreciate your wisdom <laughs> and your I, story. I, I appreciate your t your your thoughts and uh, your your experiences are absolutely and Justin. Justin? It's been a pleasure to meet both of you. Yay. God, again, I don't I don't want to hang up. I hard to follow up your uh, your smooth buttery AM voice. Got to say. <laughs> Years of practice and I fell into it entirely by accident. Gentlemen, yeah. good night. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank God you. Bless. Sir. All right, have a good night guys. And thanks for coming yep. on. And you, you know you're going to be on again. I'm just, you know, I'm just going to throw that Absolutely. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> All right. Later, guys. All right. Later. later. Yes. Yep. Hello, this is Eric. And Wendy Strauss with Stone Valley Hobby and Games. We sell board games, card games, role-playing games, and supplies. We have thousands of Magic the Gathering cards available, carry Kickstarter products, and work with veteran-owned small businesses to bring you our own line of products. 
We are a small business retailer, but we offer competitive prices, a loyalty system, and free shipping on orders over $100. As a military veteran myself, I'm a strong supporter of our armed forces, their families, and contractors out there doing the hard job. So any order from AA, AE, or EP address will be shipped absolutely free. Remember, StoneValleyGames.com, where we take your leisure seriously. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening.